Um, thank you very much, Nancy. That's, I don't know who that person is you, you uh, introduced. Um, I can't believe it's, you know, some of these things have happened. It's, it's wonderful to be here. Um, I've heard a lot about NACU from, from Nancy, and I've met several of your colleagues at, at national meetings, AACNU meetings, and heard several of your presentations and read with great interest um, the volume uh, that you published last year. So it's, it's really my honor to be here to interact with you. So thanks for, for sticking around for the last day, the last morning of the conference to be here. Um, wh what I'd like to do is, is talk a little bit about integrating undergraduate research, scholarship and creative activity using the broad language um, into faculty workload. And, and I typically don't like to talk about my own campuses on, on talks like this. I like to talk broadly, but, but, but Nancy in particular wanted us to highlight you know, what we've done at TCNJ in terms of the workload and curricular transformation. So I will talk about that at the end. Also, just an outline. Um, so this is a meant to be a workshop, so I'm going to frame the conversation um, with a, a plenary kind of talk like this. We'll take a break at about, I think we'll go till about 10.15. I've integrated some discussion throughout the presentation. And then we'll have some breakout sessions after the coffee break. So an hour and a half or an hour and 15 minutes for you to work um, in your campus groups. But before we do that, I want to um, just frame that conversation. So these are the questions that really underpin this, this presentation. I want you to think about them in the context of, of when we're going through this conversation and thinking about you know, um, your conversation later about your campus. What are the main components of the faculty role? Um, and how, these, how do these relate to your mission? What's the role and value of research, scholarship, and creative activity broadly for, for the faculty, for the students, for the, for the staff? Um, across your campus and in your mission? What's the role of undergraduate research, scholarship, or creative activity? And most importantly, do these relate to each other? Are they aligned with each other? And, and in realizing your institutional and departmental missions, and, they are, and are they articulated in your workload documents, policies, and procedures, and most importantly, in your cultures? So your campuses control these. And, the, and we'll, talk a lot about the, we'll talk a lot about culture throughout the um, the presentation will underpin it. Also, I'm, I'll, I'll send these, pres these slides to Michelle so she can get them to everyone. I'm going to break up this, this presentation into these four sections and, and uh, punctuate it several times to take a break and, and have some conversation and questions. So um, feel free to ask a question if you, if you have a burning one, but, but there will be times throughout. So this is critically important from my perspective and the many campuses that we've worked with over the years. It's about alignment. And is your campus, our campuses, is my campus thinking about aligning and actually actualizing the alignment of the institutional and departmental missions, of the role and expectations that we have for our students on our campuses, of how we've structured and mobilized the resources associated with the curriculum, of the role and the expectations for our faculty, and the key to this, you know, the, the topic of this session, the workload model and the reward and recognition structure for faculty. Are those aligned with each other? And on many campuses, they're frankly not aligned. And we don't have intentional and purposeful conversations about why that has happened and getting them back into alignment. So um, here's my, you know, this is my perspective on what a faculty member is at a college university, a dynamic, lifelong learner and in really thinking about the language of the accomplished and engaged and accessible teacher-scholar. And I have a whole other talk on the teacher-scholar model. And the most important piece of the teacher-scholar model is the hyphen. You know, how are we, how are faculty members seamlessly integrating and intertwining the pedagogical teaching and scholarly efforts in a way that, that is, again, seamless. So, ERSCA is something that ties this all together. A faculty member is a teacher-scholar. Uh, educating, continuing to create new knowledge, um, pushing the boundaries forward of their fields. Our students are learners, but they're developing scholars in that, in that context. And undergraduate research, scholarship, and creative activity is the thing that obviously can bring it together. And you've spent the last three or four days talking about this. So I know, you know this language. You've been here. I'm not going to elaborate it too much, but I wanted to sort of give you a package. Clearly, um, when we 
when we were doing workshops 20, 25 years ago, there really wasn't the body of knowledge that there is today. There's a body of scholarly knowledge that indicates that a wide variety of engaged learning or experiential endeavors or the language um, today, the high impact educational practices or HIPs as some people call them, have a, have a tangible and a measurable effect on student learning and student success. Undergraduate research is one of, of 10. Um, I would argue, and you've been talking a lot about this, that, that undergraduate research is obviously not the only way to have a transformational impact on student learning. All these other high impact practices, and there are others that make really powerful impacts on students, can, can do that. I would argue that the way that the faculty can have the biggest impact on student learning and student success and their own you know, pr programs and institutional programs is through undergraduate research. Most of the faculty have been trained as researchers, scholars, creators, and have that as part of a reappointment, tenure, and promotion process. It's part of the expectations of our jobs. It's a part of our role. We're not trained in student leadership development. We're not trained in service learning. We're not trained in study abroad. Doesn't mean we shouldn't provide professional development opportunities. Doesn't mean all faculty shouldn't engage in those kinds of things. But in a, when you have limited resources, um, where are you gonna invest your dollars? Where are you gonna invest your time? It's the, it's the natural way for faculty to have a, the most impactful um, engagement with students. So some would call it the first among equals. I know you've talked a lot about the benefits of undergraduate research earlier in the conference. I just wanted to again summarize them for you, and this is a paper that my colleague Kerry Caruxis and I published a few years ago. Undergraduate research, scholarship, and creative activity is a win-win-win. There are tremendous benefits for students, there are tremendous benefits for faculty, and institutional benefits. And, and I, if you look at that paper, the, each of those sub-bullets is outlined and, and articulated in, in greater depth. But it's, it, it's a, again, um, the impact across the campus on all sectors is, can be really tremendous. Um, so we know from a body of knowledge that the, 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 the impact for students is tremendous. The impact for students who are traditionally underserved by higher education is even greater than that of majority students. And in particular, you know, just a few examples, the grades, uh, persistence, first year to second year retention rates, graduation, completion rates, and motivation and success getting jobs and, and, and careers after, uh, after, after college for students who are under, underrepresented in, in higher ed. Um, from my vantage point, you know, again, a body of scholarly knowledge that's unequivocal, it cannot be argued. We have a moral imperative as scholars, as teachers, as academic leaders, as citizens, to use what we know to help all students, but especially students who, are, um, who have the greatest need for this kind of program. In another talk, I would say that you know, m most of the times it's honor, you know, some campuses honor students who do undergraduate research, or it's a select group of students. Arguably, they're the students who need it the less, the, need it the least. So we've got to find ways to bring undergraduate research, scholarship, and creative activity across the campus to impact all students. And that's, you know, that's, the, that's the role of, of this conversation. So, about faculty workload. How do we move from language to culture? It's, you know, we can talk a lot about you know, the, the flowery language and uh, buzzwords and branding about, around those engaged learning and, and all these kinds of things and a lot of campuses have done that and it's important but how do we design a 21st century learning environment that really embraces it how do we get it into institutional documents and promote and promotion move it from, from promotional materials into comprehensive transformation of our cultures of our policies of our curricula that really make a difference that is the challenge for us that is certainly the, the challenge so we need to rethink and reconceptualize these traditional definitions of curriculum and of, of, of the role and the work of the faculty. That's really the heart of it. Um, and it has to be done in a way that's holistic, you're, you know, what you guys have been focusing on, and in a way that, that, that enhances and thinks about this alignment that I talked about earlier. So from my vantage point, here are three discussion points that really need to happen on campuses that advance this conversation. We need to modify, innovate, transform um, the use of mainstream pedagogies used within the traditional curriculum to include engaged learning experiences, high impact pedagogies. So it's not, it won't just be enough to sort of count 
independent research students or internship students or service learning students in your load. We've got to, we've got to modify the bread and butter courses from top to bottom, right? So I'll, I'll touch on that later. We have to really sort of reconceptualize the role of the faculty from having teaching responsibilities, uh, scholarly responsibilities, and service responsibilities in an integrated whole. And, and think about the way, the way we recognize and reward that in this teacher-scholar model. And, and to my first point, we've got we've to think about faculty workload and redefine it in a way that we can bring these powerful learning experiences that have typically been outside of load um, and outside of the curriculum for students into um, workload and curriculum. So that, again, those things underpin it. So how do we move it? How do we move these experiences from the periphery, add-ons, extras, to the center of the undergraduate experience? And it's the curriculum. The, I'm, I'm going to come back. This isn't the focus of the talk, but this is um, central to the issue. There's tremendous economy to be realized in the curriculum. And, and most of us don't study it, don't think about it, don't have conversations about it. Uh, that's a whole other talk I could give as well. So um, engaged learning experiences such as undergraduate research, community engaged learning, service learning, those kinds of things have typically occurred outside of um, the, the, the typical uh, um, curriculum in the context of independent study, ex internship experiences, or small group experiences. These are often optional and non-credit bearing occurring outside of the curriculum for undergraduates and therefore not considered part of the student's primary academic program or within faculty workload. I'll give you an example from my, depart from my former department at my former institution that did a lot of undergraduate research. So I'm a biologist. The biology department, if a student took a research course, it didn't count towards the biology major. They had to use an unrestricted elective. That's, that, I mean, that's the example. And, and I, you know, that, that might be the case on some of your campuses. It's the case at lots of campuses. And the reason is, the reason for that department was, if we count undergraduate research, that means we're not going to be able to offer as many traditional courses. And my course on plant diversity and evolution, which is the best course that any biology major can take, it ought to be a required course. It ought to be offered every semester. Right? It won't be offered if we, count, if we give students credit for all this other stuff within the major. You know, right? These are the conversations that have to be had. There are curricular trade-offs that have to be had. We have to buy it within the economy that exists on our campuses. So, you know, what this situation does is it discourages the majority of students from participating in undergraduate research scholarship and creative activity, and it's a really powerful disincentive for faculty to engage in this really hard, really intense, but incredibly rewarding work, right? You, again, I, I, you know. Um, so it sounds a, a, you know, a, a loud and I think also a symbolic message about how we devalue engaged learning, high impact learning vis-a-vis -vis more traditional notions of classroom-based education. Um, and the perceived and very oftentimes real disconnect between the faculty's teacher role and scholar role, or in some cases, teacher versus scholar role. I told you earlier that, you know, from my vantage point, the, the, be the most important part of the teacher-scholar is the hyphen. One faculty member once said that, you know, does that, does that, does that dash represent a minus sign? <laughs> and it can't. It, it mustn't. And we've got to work towards that. Um, so also, faculty engagement and scholarship and research is usually considered apart from the teaching enterprise rather than as a cornerstone of this integrated teacher-scholar culture. Um, at, you know, it, as I said, workload's been uh, traditionally been centered on the teacher role and calculated in units of traditional courses or credits taught. And these courses are typically defined as classroom-based learning experiences and don't include the most promising and high-impact experiences, out-of-class research, out-of-class service learning or community-engaged research, out-of-class internships, and so on. So we've got to change that. So as I said, curricular innovation is really needed to make an impact on, on classroom-based learning and pedagogies. So I don't want that to be lost, that you have to do that. We have to do that. But we also have to give value and bring into the faculty workload system and into the curricular structure for students these experiences that are typically and traditionally and historically outside of, of the curricular load for students and the faculty load, uh, the workload for faculty. So let me spend a, a little bit of time on definitions and campus culture because this is critically important. 
and then I'm going to stop for questions and some discussion. And I would normally talk a lot more about this and give you lengthy discussions of what undergraduate research is, but I'm confident Nancy and, and Jennifer Blackmore and others did that. So here's the, the bottom line for me. Words are important, definitions are important, but what's paramount is shared understanding. We love in the academy, right, to wordsmith things to death. There should be a comma there. It shouldn't say must. It should say should. Um, you know, if you say that, am I going to be held accountable for this? So we wordsmith these seminal documents on our campus to death. It's maddening, right? But we, what we don't do is have retreats, have workshops, have town halls, have brown bag lunches where we have engaged in, um, uh, you know, lower stakes conversation and dialogue to build an understanding about what these words mean and what we mean as a community when we write them in our mission, when we write them in our core values, when we include them in our faculty handbook. So if you, if nothing, if you leave with nothing else, this is, this, this is for me one of those important things, right? It, conversation, and you've been doing that for several days here. So let me just give you a couple of examples, three examples, for um, high impact pedagogies. And you know, you, you know, I suspect your campuses already do or would like to bring these kinds of experiences into your workload system for the faculty. The faculty certainly want to get credit for it. And, and I'm a dean, I'm going to say the faculty should get credit for this. Um, but these are important, <coughs> right? So how do we define and talk about undergraduate research, scholarship, and creative activity or creative work? ERSCA. Is ERSCA the same thing as an investigative or inquiry-based, discovery-based, problem-based experience that someone might have in a first-year course? Do you count that the same in your curricular model for students? Do you count it the same in your faculty workload model? Unless you have a shared understanding of what these things mean on your campus, then, then a, a, you know, workload inclusion is doomed. So it's critical to have that conversation. Civic engagement. We all want to do this. This is critically important. This is central to your consortium and your campuses. And I'm confident you've, you've thought a lot about this. Is service learning, community-based research, volunteerism the same thing? There are elements in there that are the same. They might be the same on some campuses. From my vantage point and on my campus, they're different. And, and you need to have an understanding of what these things are if you want to bring it into the faculty workload model, right? The nature of student engagement, the expectations for your students are different. The degree of engagement with the faculty mentor or mentors is different from a volunteer experience than a service learning experience than a community engaged learning experience. We have to have conversation about what these words mean. And finally, independent student work. Is an independent research project the same as an independent study project, the same as an internship project in terms of faculty engagement and faculty work, in terms of student engagement and student work? Not on my campus. They're very different kinds of things. So I, I, I used this slide at a talk um, last year, and you know, someone right out of the gate, you know, you didn't mention um, individualized study. Does that mean you don't value individualized study? I said, thank you very much, you've made my point, right? And then he described individualized study, and I said, we call that independent study on our campus, the way you've described that. Put it in a document, have conversation about it, so you have understanding about it. What one department calls independent study, another department calls independent research. These words are, these words are important, but the understanding of what they mean and, and how they value is important. We don't take time to do that, that's critical. This is a question that we get all the time. How do you count undergraduate research, scholarship, or creative activity? Is it teaching or is it scholarship? It's both. And the teaching component can and should, in my opinion, be counted, the mentorship component can and should be counted as teaching. The outcome component can and should be counted as scholarly and creative work. The problem on our campuses and our department, and when you get to T and P and workload issues, is they get conflated because we don't have conversations about you know, the different pieces of, of undergraduate research 
and scholarship and creative activity. So dissecting it out, and again, Kerr, that, what a slide I pulled out was four characteristics that define undergraduate research in that paper that Carrie Corruxis and I published. You, you can find it in there. Um, and there's a, a wonderful paper that Nancy and Mary Beckman published a few years ago on the continua of undergraduate research. There isn't just one thing, it's a broad spectrum. And, and you don't start on one sort of one point. Here's something else that gets conflated. Workload and tenure and promotion. Um, so they're the same thing in a lot of people's minds, but they're different. They are very different and we need to have conversation about it. Faculty workload systems and tenure promotions are different animals and they fulfill different institutional roles. The workload system, the way we measure faculty work, um, is really about delivering the primary purpose of the institution, engaging with our students in, in, um, in educational endeavors in and out of the classroom, creating new scholarly and creative works, and so on and so forth. So it's the delivery, you know, it's the primary, functioning on the primary purpose. Reappointment, tenure, and promotion is an evaluative role and a, and a reward role. They ought to be aligned, they ought to be closely aligned, but they're different things. So you need to have conversation, from my vantage point, about how these are separate, but how they intersect and how they're aligned. And most importantly, they need to align with the, with the institutional mission and the institutional values. So there's often, you know, back to my first slide or second slide about alignment. Um, a lot of times, you know, people have different perspectives about what their institution is. Um, a, a colleague of mine calls, you know, I, I'm at a primarily undergraduate institution. Technically, we're a comprehensive institution, but we're a primarily undergraduate institution. So, you know, a colleague of mine likes to talk about R1 envy, research one envy. You know, someone having the ideas that we ought to have the research expectations or the research culture, the research infrastructure, the research investments that a research flagship does. That is a misalignment. Right? So having that, that conversation is really important. This is also important when you create workload documents and tenure and promotion evaluations. I'll talk later about us creating these things called disciplinary standards for scholarship, which benchmark um, you know, what the expectations are for scholarly and creative work. So I, you know, I'm, I'm the dean of the School of Science. I can't have a biology department that has R1 expectations and in a chemistry department that has expectations um, you know, from, from a two-year institution. That's not who we are, that doesn't make sense. So we'll talk about that some more. Um, and, I, and the last point I've already made, documents, policies, practices um, are important and can help shift the culture. These need to be equitable and transparent. I'll come back to that later as well. Equitability and transparency is important. You know, everyone knows about deals. I hate deals. You know, so-and-so worked out this deal underneath the table. So-and-so's got this deal. It doesn't help build trust. It doesn't help build a culture of, of you know, of, of, um, of accountability and of moving forward in a, in a progressive way. So it's important to have principles established, guiding <coughs> principles that help define how these things are calculated. This is also important in, as we enter the workload conversation about it changing workload. And this is hard for a lot of faculty. Um, who d haven't thought about this, and, you know, and, and not all ad administrators have thought about it or are involved in the conversation. Understanding the economic drivers on your campus is critically important. You know, how are decisions made? How are resources allocated? Is it, a credit, is it about credit hour production, instructional productivity? Is it about contact hours, course sizes and types, student outcomes, revenue generated from grants, or other kinds of things? Are you, are you benchmarking yourself institutionally or departmentally against similar institutions or departments? So again, um, sometimes there isn't sense to how the economy operates on a campus. Other campuses, many public institutions, are all about credit hour production. So your, every institution is a little bit different and having an understanding of that to guide the conversation because it's a zero sum game in terms of the dollars, right? In fact, it's decreasing on many campuses in today's economic climate. So there aren't new resources, significant resources coming from most campuses around this country. Certainly at mine, a public, public institution. Finally, just to, to reiterate a point I made earlier, there is often significant economy to be realized in the curriculum. And if, if you really want to make, I think if, if we really want to make major headway in this area, we've got to think about the curriculum. We've got to revise and innovate the curriculum. And the faculty have got to be on board for that and understand that. And that, that was key to our strategy at the College of New Jersey. So workload strategies. So I, I, want, to, I want to walk through different kind of approaches 
that, that different campuses around the country use. Um, and in reading the three documents that you, know, that, that you guys put together, some of the elements of what I've talked about are in a few of your campuses that, are, that shared um, what they're doing. And then, and, then, and then I'll talk about what we did at the College of New Jersey, which is a, um, a more a comprehensive and a holistic approach. Before, from my vantage point, before any campus gets into a conversation about shifting the workload structure, you need to set some guiding principles um, that are discussed campus-wide. Um, any workload system has got to be flexible, equitable, and transparent. And those are key. So having those conversations early on and then developing a seminal document that articulates that workload system, and if you provide weighting for different things, articulates that in that document is critical. It's critical not to create a tiered system of faculty and that all contributions, um, contributions of all faculty members need to be valued, specifically to this example we were talking about earlier, because people feel threatened. Um, because, I, you know, I never had a research agenda or I started, you know, I had a research agenda when I first started and then I got put into 15 different courses and it all kind of fell by the wayside. You know, I'm going to be a, a third class, you know, faculty member in the, in the future. I'm going to have to teach more and so on and so forth. So you've got to create an, an environment and a culture where everyone feels honored and valued and there's a system of mutual, mutual trust. So it's not that it's not that you're doing you're you know you're 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 doing less or you're doing more you're doing different in a different way, and that those are hard conversations to have and part of it's the the economic. I don't have this as a specific bullet point on any of these slides, but in addition to the curricular size issue that we talked about, we'll talk about more in a few minutes ago. We we also had to think about right sizing the faculty. So if you go into a system, you know, kind of where you are, the, a department might not be right sized at the particular moment in time. You can't necessarily shift it overnight, but you have to acknowledge what are the drivers, the economic drivers and the principles that govern faculty line allocation. And this is a hard conversation for some, right? In some areas we're going to increase, in some areas we might pull back. But that's the, that's the nature of it. Okay, I, I mean, I've referenced curriculum. Um, Backward design, you know, very few of us do this. Really think about a curriculum, a curriculum, a package of courses that a student takes to complete a degree and start with the outcomes and then design the curricula and then design the courses. We generally say, we've been teaching these courses, all students are taking these five courses as core courses, they're going to take five electives because of baggage, historical baggage. It might not mean it. We don't think about curriculum design in terms of the size, the scope, and the nature of a curriculum. How many courses should a student take to get a biology degree in the 21st century? And oftentimes, the size of the required courses should be fewer. And when that happens, you free up resources to be able to move into these other areas. Uh, diversified enrollments and varied pedagogies. And as I referenced earlier, you know, it can't just be about bringing those, those sort of typically outside of load things into load. We need to scaffold research into the curriculum, into the bread and butter curriculum where we vertically integrate student learning experiences in ways that intentionally create connections for them, build on past learning, and achieve outcomes developmentally. Because um, then you don't have to retrain every student when they get to you as a senior or a junior because they've learned it in their courses. Okay, so here are five or six different systems. Um, some campuses, and these are my monikers, create what I call incentive systems. And a goal of an incentive system is to build and to promote faculty development around undergraduate research, scholarship, creative activity, to get them interested in it, to get some buy-in, um, to enhance the culture around undergraduate research. So it, it involves money. So faculty apply competitively for some internal funding grant, and the package on, it varies, but here's one example undergraduate wages for the students to engage in the project or projects with the faculty mentor, travel support to go to a conservatory, a museum, visit a colleague or a conference, um, uh, a grant writing workshop, and, and reassign time for the faculty member to engage with the student. And the deliverable is a submitted grant proposal. So they're, they're trying, he's trying to develop a culture here that focuses on undergraduate research, scholarship, and creative activity, and, 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 and bringing in some additional revenue through grant support um, and name recognition for the institution. 
So this, is, this, is, this helps build, you know, build a system. I like it in lots of ways. It's a good way to start. It's not sustainable if it's the only model from my vantage point, and it's all about exter external necessarily versus in internal. But it, it, it can be very effective for, for some programs. Someone was asking about this. Senior project systems. Here, all students in the department, not just the honor students, but all students conduct some kind of credit-bearing, year-long project um, in their senior year, and the names of these experiences and courses and the amount of credit vary by campus. But it becomes a, a departmental you know, requirement for the major, or in some cases, an institutional requirement. Each student's project is supervised or mentored by a faculty member, and then X number of student projects supervised equates to one full course unit. What range have you seen on X? Banking systems are used a lot around the academy. Um, so here, students formally enroll in a credit-bearing independent research course or some other type of high-impact experiential course. Enrollment records are, are kept by instructors, um, and they accrue teaching credit. Then once a full course unit worth of credit has been accrued, the instructor receives a full course equivalent. So a lot of campuses do this, and it works really well. A key to this in every one of these systems is the students enroll in the course and pay tuition and fees on it. And it's included within the curriculum of the department, right? So this works really well for a lot of people. And I think if everyone's doing it, there's this constant sort of rotation and a churn. One of the things that, you know, that I, I don't like about it, you know, is that you do the work up front and you might not get the credit when you need it. I'm working on a book this semester. I need my, you know, course assignment for scholarly work this semester. I don't need it next semester when I'm going to have enough credits. That's where the flexibility system comes in, right? So, so but, but this, is, this is a really good system that works. This is what I call a departmental rotation system. Students formally enroll in a credit-bearing co research course or some other type of high-impact course. The cumulative student credit hours generated are used in a coordinated and a shared way um, uh, by the department via a rotation plan. So every faculty member who's engaging students in scholarly work gets a course unit every X number of semesters. Um, so I did this in my department when I was a chair because I had, I had a dean who was, you know, it was about every faculty member was, had to produce this many student credit hours. Public institution was all about student credit hour generation. I said, look, let me, let me work on it. Let me produce the credit hours we need to for the department. And I'm going to bring you that. And then we had a lot of students who were doing independent research, but they weren't registering for credit because they took what was called scholarship renewal hours. We got them all to register for credit, and it gave us two, two courses or three courses worth of you know, research courses every single, every single um, semester. So we began this rotation plan, you know, and it really worked. But it was in the economic model because they had to be registered for the course. They weren't previously doing that. This is a system I like a lot, and in reading one of your plans, I think I saw this sort of in, in one, of, one of the institution's plans. This is my language. I call them fixed and flexible weighting systems. So the overall load is determined at some regular interval, annually or biannually. The overall load includes a fixed component and a negotiated component. And here's one example of a campus that I know. Teaching is 50% of the effort, research 10% of the effort, service 10% of the effort then 30% is negotiated on this annual or biannual basis in ways that make sense for where a faculty member is at that particular point in time. I, you know, I'm getting ready for my sabbatical. I'm working on a book. I've got lots of students. I need more in the research arena. I'm the chair of the curriculum committee this year. We're working on a major curriculum overhaul. I'm going to put more into service, right? The trick here, though, is is you got to balance it holistically across the department. You can't have every faculty member pouring it into research or scholarship or creative activity and not fulfilling the, the role of the department. That never happens, right? But, but having that kind of transparent, equitable conversation about, we got to balance it out institutionally. we got to ba balance it out departmentally. And if the department is on board, frankly, you can have conversations departmentally about, okay, I'm going to do this this year, you do it next year. Um, the, a key here, though, is also aligning the annual and biannual evaluation with the negotiated workload. I reviewed a campus one time that had a system like this, and then in their annual evaluation or their you know, reappointment or promotion tenure conversation, um, the expectations weren't adjusted for how they'd adjusted their load. So if you're putting more in the research arena, you ought to be having some more in that arena. If you're putting more in curriculum, in service, the curriculum should have been developed, right? So 
so there's some, you know, uh, outcomes that need to be there. And then this is what I call a comprehensive transformation, and this is the T, C, and J example that I'll, that I'll give you um, in a few minutes. And, and, and we started with some of the other elements that I was talking about, but at some particular point, it's really thinking about driving at the learning environment that, that you want to create as an institution and having um, these conversations about the role and expectations for students and faculty, defining guiding principles, looking at the curricula, thinking about this teacher-scholar culture, and then shifting from a traditional teaching load system to a more comprehensive workload system. And I'll give you the details of that um, now. Um, so, we, we did this system at the College of New Jersey, we called it an academic transformation. And there was a long lead up to that. And I'm not, I don't have time to give you the whole backstory. Um, and there were two pieces to it. Um, transformation of the student work piece, which is the curriculum, and then transformation of the faculty workload system um, piece. In reality, they were happening in parallel. Um, they got finalized at different steps, but we were piloting and testing and doing different things. I can't talk about them at the exact same time, so I'm just gonna take them in turn. Um, there was a piece in higher ed, Inside Higher Ed last year that, that talked a little bit about this. Um, so, I, you know, I've alluded to this, but here, you know, in a graphic is, is really the driver for what we were trying to do at TCNJ. We wanted to reconceptualize how learning was happening on our campus. We wanted to reconceptualize and, and redefine the learning environment. So we, we began to think about what is the role of the student in a, at a primarily undergraduate institution, really, on our campus, and then how do they go about doing their work on the campus, engaging in the campus? And again, that's primarily through the curriculum, but there are also co-curricular elements. And we've modified some co-curricular elements as well. Um, so, and similarly, what is the role of the faculty on a campus like this? How do they go about doing their work? How do we go about interacting with students in this sense? So it was really about, again, sort of thinking about this holistically and, 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 and conceptual, reconceptualizing, redefining the learning environment. So these were the goals that drove the student work transformation, the transformation of the curriculum. We want, you know, quite frankly, the bottom line was we wanted to have a more deeply intellectually engaging campus. We wanted to engage our students um, to challenge them more intellectually in the classroom, outside of the classroom, and, and you know, kind of bridge that curricular, co-curricular gap. We wanted to interact with students in and out of the classroom and, and recognizing, quite frankly, that learning is happening outside of the classroom a lot. And it needs to happen more through faculty student research labs, through faculty student artistic studios, through practicum experiences and nursing with, the stu with students and their faculty mentors and all across the disciplines. The classroom isn't the sole place for learning. The classroom is a place to consolidate and contextualize the learning. That's a mindset shift. And quite frankly, it's still going on. I would not be honest if I said everyone is like fully there, right? I mean, it's a total evolution. We wanted to convey the strong sense of inquiry about how knowledge is acquired and created and assess learning outcomes in a pretty significant way. Here's the overview and the summary of, 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 of the whole thing. We transformed, and again, that was the language that we used, and I think in retrospect that was important language because it set a frame of mind, right? This isn't just a tweak. We're transforming the whole system. We transformed the entire college curriculum, providing students with more rigor, more flexibility, and credit for high-impact engaged learning experiences, and I'll talk about what that means shortly. Here are some of the tricks. The basic footprint did not change for courses. It wasn't about adding seat time. It was about reducing it, quite frankly. Um, we focused on learning outcomes and not seat time. It was a really comprehensive effort across the entire campus with an incredibly ambitious timeline. We transformed the general education program, we call it liberal learning now, the first year experience and all departmental and program curricula in 18 months. It was at a breakneck pace. And in retrospect, you know, that was also key to the success because it was, you know, it was going, it was going, it was going. There wasn't stalling. You know, there were important points of contention. There were important points of conversation. But it's not like we're going to wait six months and then reconsider it. We need to do this next year. It was moving. Um, we shifted from a credit hour-based system to a course unit-based system. 
um, we transformed each course to be focused on the learning outcomes, not seat time or content. Each course unit effectively became a four credit hour course. So this is part of the economy, right? So, every, so your three hour non-lab science course or a three hour English course or a three hour history course is now a fact, effectively a four credit hour course in which the students are having a deeper, more significant intellectual experience without adding a required fourth hour to the, to, for, to the student's requirement. We'll talk about that more. In terms of the requirements, the, the institutional ideal for course distribution was a third in liberal learning, a third in the major, and a third in a second major or minor or unrestricted electives. This worked well for some areas. It didn't work well for more technical areas, the sciences, engineering. They simply have more than a third in the, in the major, but we pulled it back. And I'll give you some examples in a few minutes. So departmental curricula, again, this is where the economy happened. So we looked actuarially at, at what the cost of this was going to be, and it, and it was more or less uh, even. Um, so departmental curricula needed to be right-sized, and that meant often smaller. The general education program needed to be smaller. We shrunk gen ed. We shrunk most majors. And they needed to include high-impact experiences as credit-bearing within the major. So students are paying tuition on these experiences. It needed to include a diversity of learning experiences and learning contexts with pedagogically appropriate course sizes. So it doesn't make sense for a biology major to have all lectures. They need big lectures. They need lectures with writing. They need small lectures. They need seminar discussions. They need one-on-one -on -one research experiences. So a curriculum ought to have a diversified enrollment economy as well. We thought about that. So here's an example from science. Um, so a, a science major would have one to two introductory courses. The biology department went from two introductory courses to one introductory course. Um, four core courses that might be large to medium two upper-level courses, it might be methods-based, field-based, or research-based, two seminar courses, and two independent research courses. So that's a smaller major in many cases. And some departments thought about their correlate majors, their correlate courses that were required outside of their, you know, their department, and, and shrunk those as well. So here's the comparison of the old system versus the new system. Five classes per semester, and the driver for this was our students were taking five courses per semester. They were superficially engaging in them. They were spread too thin. They weren't really engaging deeply intellectually in the material with their faculty, with each other. That was the driver for making the shift. Ten classes per year, typically three credit hours, and you can, you know, typical credit hour distribution. Now they take four classes per semester, eight per year. If they overload past four, they have to get the dean's approval. So these courses have been ramped up in terms of the intellectual rigor. Um, and they finished 32 courses in a, in a, um, in a year, in, a, in four years. Take some questions. And then I'm going to move on to the faculty work piece. Uh, I'm Nancy Nijon from Sanford uh, in Alabama. Uh, I'm wondering, we have, within arts and sciences, most of our credits are four credit courses, and then within our professional schools, most of them are three credits. Um, and we run into some challenges in terms of, uh, we made that transition, I don't know, it was before I was in the position, probably about 10, 15 years ago, and partially it was to help faculty so they didn't have to teach as many classes. I mean, that was a little bit behind it. But there's some challenges when students transfer in, in terms of federal financial aid, and when students, if they're taking fewer classes and they drop a class, and then, you know, their satisfactory academic progress and things like that. So are you running into any things like that with that change from a three credit to a four? I know it's just one piece of obviously this whole model, but. Yeah, um, occasionally we're in some issues there, but we, we look at equivalency in a pretty significant way. And certainly students that are coming from two-year um, institutions and have an associate's degree will bring it over in, entire, in, in an entirety. Um, in other cases, we'll, um, you know, we have some half credit, half, half course units. Um, in some areas, they have a lot of transfer students coming in, and they can make them up that way. Um, it's generally not an issue on, on our campus. It, it comes out in the wash. We'll work with students. It's, it's, it, it's become an issue in terms of as we've grown our summer program, though, because our courses are four credit hours. And if a student is you know, living in, near us and wants to take a summer course with us, but they're a you know, native student at another college or university, and their requirement is three credit hours, it's not necessarily the credit hours, it's the cost. 
So we're at a slightly higher price point because it's a four credit hour, more deep experience. For students who are preparing for either professional schools or graduate schools, and these schools have certain criteria for coursework that has to be done, anatomy, physiology, organic chemistry, and stuff like that, how do you manage to equate your curriculum to what these schools might require? Yeah. It, it matches incredibly well, and 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 you and you know you will encounter you know concerns from faculty about that, and we had those experiences. When we went to this shift, our students are achieving essential learning outcomes at a greater rate. They're getting into graduate schools. They're getting into professional schools at a higher rate. They're getting jobs at a higher rate. Um, they're they're getting these experiences. So. Um, the bi biology department reduced its requirement for physics courses from two semesters to one semester for the general degree. Those that go into medical school need two semesters of physics, so they simply take that second semester as an unrestricted elective. But but it's you know it's it's pulled back from the size of the major, so it's, it allows students to customize what makes sense for them. Certainly, the programs that are accredited, you know, have have some things to think about in terms of their professional accreditation. Our education department, you know, departments have revised their curricula to provide deeply engaging experiences in ways that are earlier in the curriculum and prepare students for their student teaching opportunities and so on and so forth. But they are a little bit more constrained. Let me give you two other. Let me give you one example now, and I'll give you the second example in this next section. So our our business school, which is accredited by AACSB, wasn't really on board and thrilled and didn't fully transform the curriculum with the same level of engagement that the rest of the campus did. And the, the first time after the transformation happened, the AACSB creditors came and learned what was going on in the campus um, and so on and so forth and then said to us, to the, to the school of business, why, don't, why aren't you giving your students these, you know, these opportunities, these experiences? So oftentimes there are ways to integrate you know, curricular changes in ways that are fully commensurate and aligned with what accreditors are looking for. The accreditors are defining outcomes. They're not, most of them, not necessarily how you package the courses that deliver those outcomes. Okay, let me, let me get into the last section. Because um, we have, we have, we'll have shall I, should we take a break now and finish it later? Or? Yeah? Let's take a break and then I'll finish this last section. Come back at 10.30.